formative for many student radicals who came of age in the 1960s and 70s were the Students for a Democratic Society, the Cultural Revolution, May 1968 in Paris, Revolutions in the Third World, and the 1970s New Communist Movement. For many leftists who sought to engage, critique, and advance these movements, Marxism meant Maoism, which they understood to be an advance, an advancing of Marxism-Leninism. Currently, as the left of Gen X comes of, I'm sorry, Gen Z comes of age, uh, well, yeah, we come of age. Uh, a kind of neo-Maoism is growing more popular, both on college campuses and online. What is Maoism, and what is its relationship to Marxism? How did Maoism emerge out of the Chinese Revolution? What made Maoism plausible, and what makes it appealing today? What may have rendered it implausible? What is the significance of Maoism as a political tendency on the left? And why did Maoism seem, in some ways, to be more successful than, for instance, Trotskyism? What has Maoism been, and where is it going? How does its history weigh on us today? And why should we care about it? OK, we're good. So the, the speakers are going to be in the following order. Uh, first, we're going to have Jerry Harris, then Norman Finkelstein, then Mike McNair, and then C.J. Hunt. And I'll just briefly introduce each of them. I'm going to introduce all four here at the beginning of the panel uh, at once. Jerry Harris is National Secretary of the Global Studies Association of North America and a member of the International Executive Board of the Network for Critical Studies of Global Capitalism. He contributes frequently to race and class, science and society, and international critical thought. For 15 years, he did labor organizing at oil refineries in Long Beach, a tobacco factory in Louisville, and U.S. Steel in Chicago, before teaching at DeVry University and heading the Faculty Association. Norman Finkelstein, at, who's at, at the end, is a political scientist, activist, former professor and author. He is a graduate of Binghamton University and received his PhD in political science at Princeton University. Although his primary fields of research are the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the politics of the Holocaust, he has spoken openly about his erstwhile beliefs as a Maoist activist, which he later came to reject. Here on my, on my immediate right, Mike McNair is a retired professor of law at the University of Oxford, where he authored numerous works on 17th and 18th century English legal theory. McNair is also a member of the Provisional Central Committee of the Communist Party of Great Britain, CPGB, and author of Revolutionary Strategy, Marxism and the Challenge of Left Unity from 2008. Finally, C.J. Hunt is an undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz and a member of the Revolutionary Student Organization. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Jerry. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Platypus Society, for inviting me and the others to speak today. Um, I'm a, what's known as a red diaper baby. My uh, grandparents were founding members of the Communist Party here in Chicago in 1919. Uh, my father grew up in an orphanage here in Hyde Park, actually, and at the age of 20 went to Spain to uh, fight against Franco in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, my uncle was uh, underground for four years during the McCarthy period and on the FBI's 10 most wanted list uh, for conspiring to overthrow the United States government. So that's how I came to Marxism. Uh, <laughs> and uh, by the time I was hitting high school and then college, uh, you know, the Soviet-Chinese split was in full bloom. And I think to many of us, uh, you know, the uh, Chinese uh, line represented a more revolutionary line. I mean, there was the Maoist slogan of uh, countries want liberation, nations want self-determination, people want revolution. And we compared that to Brezhnev and the Soviet Union, which called for peaceful competition with uh, the United States and 
it just seemed that Maoism in China offered a more revolutionary path. Uh, it was also a period of massive rebellions throughout the Third World. Like there were armed struggles throughout Latin America, throughout Africa, throughout Asia. Uh, and that attracted a lot of uh, black, Latinx, and Asian youth to Maoism here in the United States also. Uh, so um, two of the first things I read in terms of Marxism was uh, On Contradiction and On Theory and Practice, uh, both essays by Mao that he wrote in the 30s. Uh, I think still classics of Marxism, Leninism, and I would recommend them to everybody in this room if you haven't read them. Uh, but I want to concentrate mainly here in the few minutes we have um, on the effects of uh, Maoism uh, and on the, Ameri the new communist movement here in the United States, which really takes off during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and uh, so during the Cultural Revolution, which had its positive points, but also many negative points too, uh, there was a real emphasis on the correct political line. That line leads everything. And that if you don't have the correct political line, you're an enemy. You know, you're an enemy of socialism. You're an enemy of the working class. Uh, and uh, there were splits, of course, in communist parties all over the world and attempts to build new communist parties. And that was also here in the United States with uh, maybe half a dozen or a dozen different organizations trying to create a new communist party. Uh, and we picked up on the style that the correct line determines everything. And that each of these small organizations therefore had the correct line and all the other organizations were not only wrong, but ultimately enemies of the working class. Uh, so it led to a lot of competition for recognition uh, by the Chinese of your own particular organization. Mine was the October League Communist Party Marxist-Leninists. Uh, and uh, not only competition with other groups, but sectarian attitudes. Not only towards other communists, but also to often independent leaders of uh, social movements who didn't align with your organizational uh, theories and ideas. So um, in terms of the various non-cadre left organizations, there was a real competition to seize leadership from the top. Uh, and that was certainly true in the National Lawyers Guild, uh, in Vietnam Veterans Against the War, in the Welfare Rights Movement, in the African Solidarity Committee, in the Chinese Friendship Committee, et cetera, et cetera. And there were similar left errors in almost all these organizations, whether it was the Revolutionary Communist Party or the CPML or the League of Revolutionary Struggle or the Black Workers Congress, and we can go on and on because there were a good number of organizations. But all of them had a similar approach to trying to build a new Communist Party where line was the most important thing, not practice but line. Uh, and the problem, of course, is that none of these organizations were really bigger than 1,000 members in a country of, at that time, about 250 million people. So how can you think of yourself really as the vanguard of the working class uh, with that size of, and that limited amount of experience? It violates everything that Mao taught around practice and theory having a dialectical relationship and taking your line to the masses and then looking at your experiencing, coming back, refining your theory, taking it back out into mass practice in a continual dialectical process of understanding how to better organize uh, the revolution. Um, so uh, as splits started to occur uh, in all these organizations, I think that happened because most people who had joined these organizations, overwhelmingly youth in their 20s, uh, with very little membership, almost, I mean, the people from the old Communist Party, you can count them on two hands, uh, 
from all these organizations, you know. Um, most of the people who joined had pretty good experience in the mass anti-war, anti-imperialist movement around Vietnam and the mass struggles around civil rights in the 60s, right? And so it didn't take too long to understand our isolation and our ineffectiveness because we had the experience of being involved in truly mass movements with mass influence that not only hundreds of thousands, but millions of people were active in. And so that uh, rupture between that mass experience and the rather sectarian limited experience that we were running into, the roadblocks and the walls that we were running into because of our dogmatism and our sectarianism soon was evident uh, and these organizations started to break up and split. The CPML itself lasted for about uh, 10 years. That's not to say that there were not some successes in labor organizing. Uh, I think some important theoretical understandings around racial capitalism and the uh, strategic relationships between class and race. Uh, and I think each group could point to certain victories. But overall, uh, it was a failure, a clear failure, because you look at where these groups are today, and if a few of them still exist, like the RCP, they essentially have minimal, minimal influence in a country of over 300 million people, right? So um, I think uh, what people learned was to uh, base our theory on our practice here in the United States, understanding the American experience uh, and not looking to foreign experiences to uh, define our identity uh, and who we were and our major ideas. That's not to say that we shouldn't study Marxism and the experience of China or Cuba or Vietnam and the Soviet revolutions. All of them have important lessons. But the main lesson, the main thing we have to understand is our reality here in the United States uh, and how to uh, build a revolutionary and socialist movement here. So, thank you. Norman. Well, thank you for having me here, and I'm always excited to speak before young people. And uh, so I want to take advantage of this occasion. Uh, the balance sheet on that Maoism episode, I think, is overwhelmingly negative, And there are lessons to be learned, but the lessons are overwhelmingly negative. On the other hand, I think it's true to say that the transformation of China from the sick man of Asia at the beginning of the 20th century to the cutting edge of world capitalism at the beginning of the 21st century is the most spectacular event of the 20th century, next to which every other event pales by comparison. So that's to say something was happening there, but I think it was widely misunderstood by our generation, at any rate, what exactly it was. Having said that, when I was turning 50 years old, I wrote a small memoir just to make sense of the first half century of my life. I never published it, and for this event, I pulled it out of the, uh, my dusty files, and as it happened, there was a large part of it devoted to my life as a Maoist. And I'll just be reading from it. I know it's always deadening to read from a text. I know from being a professor, it's the last thing you should do. But nonetheless, I think it captures the feeling of why somebody might have gravitated in that direction. And so if you'll forgive me for reading a text, and I'll do my best to make eye contact. Um, uh, let me begin. <clears throat> in my youth, I was a Maoist a political tendency prone to anti-intellectualism. Nonetheless, I devoured every book I could find on China. 
And personally, I gravitate towards what you might call the erudite Maoists, like Charles Bettelheim, a French Marxist, quite prominent and very smart. I studied under him eventually in Paris. And the great and wonderful uh, Paul M. Sweezy, a respected Harvard-trained economist who eventually became both a mentor and a personal friend to me. After Mao's death, his heirs, they were called the Gang of Four, were in short order dethroned and his legacy dismantled. The rapid collapse of Maoism forced me to rethink many of my beliefs. There must have been a lot more rot at the core of the Chinese Revolution than I was led and allowed myself to be led and led others to believe. What hurt most for someone who thought he knew so much, namely myself, was how foolish I had been. I remember one non-believer, the father of a friend of mine, telling this true believer that before I ever got to China, there would be a McDonald's at the Great Wall. <laughs> I laughed contemptuously at his petty bourgeois cynicism. He used to say, Norman, why do you always call me a petty bourgeois? Why not a full bourgeois? <laughs> well, a McDonald's did open for business at the Great Wall, and I lost all interest in making my personal pilgrimage to China. From the day the Gang of Four was overthrown to this day, I'm now writing when I'm turning 50, I've not opened a single book or read through to the end a single article on China. It was genuinely too painful. Those not wondering what a Maoist is wonder how I could have been one. It's a historical moment that has vanished without a trace. Amidst the daily horrors of the war in Vietnam and the race war at home, I commit myself not just to being a reformist in the style of Ralph Nader, although he did excellent work, but on the contrary, I commit myself to a world turned upside down. For all its formerly Marxist ideology, the Soviet Union seemed to resemble the United States. The gray on gray of Soviet style socialism didn't exactly fire the imagination. On the other hand, China, China appeared to be on the brink of ushering in a new world. Those coming back from Maoist China, there were many emigres went to live in China. Those coming back, they echoed the writer Lincoln Steffens, who when he came back from Lenin's Russia, he said, I have seen the future, and it works. From Chairman Mao down to the ordinary worker and peasant, Everyone seemed to be practicing a simple, austere lifestyle, contemptuous of bourgeois amenities, and committed to a larger collective purpose. Maoism seemed irre irrefutable proof of an alternative to the rat race existence here at home. To cynics who maintained that creating a society based on non-acquisitive values. Those who said that was utopian, I always said, look at China. It was even said that petty theft had disappeared. Bicycles weren't chained. Lost items were returned. While I was taking a nap late one night in my college student center, someone stole my brand new work shoes from, as it were, right under my feet. <laughs> Furious at this theft and having had to walk home barefoot in the slush, the next day in my Chinese foreign policy class, I indignantly declared, this wouldn't have happened in China. <laughs> Many in the class no doubt thought that it deserved this self-righteous asshole, namely myself, right. The basic principles of Chinese communism 
resonated with me. Foreign Minister Joe Enlai always had pinned to his lapel the button, serve the people. Praising the wisdom and dignity of ordinary people, a Mao quotation declared, and now I'm quoting him, the workers and peasants were the cleanest people, and even though their hands were soiled and their feet smeared with cow dung, they were really cleaner than the bourgeois and petty bourgeois intellectuals. A sports meet in China would begin and end with the chant, friendship first, competition second. I was working at Project Head Start at the time. I was a volunteer. There was a skeptical female coworker of mine whenever I talked about China, but then her eyes lit up when I quoted Mao's aphorism, women hold up half the sky. In one parable I relished reciting, Mao wrote, death can be weightier than Mount Tai or lighter than a feather. To die for the people is weightier than Mount Tai, but to die for the fascists and oppressors is lighter than a feather. Back spent, spirits broken, the Chinese people had borne 10,000 insults and injuries at the hands of the European imperialists. It sent prideful shivers down my spine, and dare I say, it still does. Each time I read Mao's declaration in 1949, when he declared the victory of the Chinese Revolution, he famously said, the Chinese people have stood up. The Chinese resolution, Revolution had restored their human dignity. And it was undeniable that under Mao's leadership in China, hitherto the sick man of Asia, China had abolished famine, except for the Great Leap Period, which I'll get to, and dramatically improved health care and increased literacy. When simultaneously China came under communist rule and India achieved independence, they had stood at comparable levels of development. But in Mao's China, one no longer witnessed the scenes of abject wretchedness ubiquitous in India. The poverty I witnessed on traveling to New Delhi in 1979 came to me as a real shock. It was my first trip to a third world country. After handing a street urchin one peanut, I suddenly found myself trailed by scores more. I couldn't sleep that night, haunted by the nightmare of being devoured by them. Unlike the Soviets, who had embarked on the policy of detente, the Chinese communists declared, or stridently declared, the necessity as well as the possibility of defeating U.S. imperialism. Did Mao say that, quote, a just cause is bound to win? Mao said at the time also, there is great disorder under heaven. That is a good thing. Mao Zedong lived like him, we fervently chanted. Dare to struggle, dare to win. Silly as it now sounds, back then, the slogan truly inspired. You no doubt are wondering, how could I have been blind to the numberless crimes of Mao and for that matter, the Bolsheviks. In fact, I was able to conjure in my mind a thousand justifications, some more, some less plausible, one often contradicting the other, each containing a kernel of truth, but although not wrong, 
none of these extenuations were adequate. I could first of all draw on an arsenal of cliches. Revolution is not a dinner party, Mao Zedong was famously quoted as saying. Rosa Luxemburg, she said, revolutions, they're not pink teas. And then the old time communists, they would say, to make an omelet, you have to break eggs. Or when you fell a tree, chips will fly. If on occasion I found myself inwardly recoiling at the bloody horrors, I imagined that it was because I was too faint of heart, lacking the requisite ruthlessness to be a true revolutionary. It wasn't Lenin's problem, it was mine. And anyhow, loving Beethoven and revering Tolstoy, as Lenin did, logically precluded in my mind that he could be a brutal murderer. No one can say that Rosa Luxemburg lacked humanistic and democratic sensibilities. Yet, despite her withering critique of the Bolshevik Revolution, she ultimately defended it, arguing that, and now I'm quoting it, quoting her, the distortions have been prescribed by necessity and compulsion. And then she went on to praise Lenin and Trotsky as, quote, still the only ones up to now who can cry with Hutton, I have dared. Even if I did harbor doubts about China, about Maoism, it seemed that openly venting them would no, give... Okay. Yes? Just if you could try to wind up. Yeah, okay. Sorry. I, I'm going to just skip to the end. I never can uh, calculate uh, the time. I'm going to just skip to the very end. I recognize this might happen. Um, yeah, that's fine. No problem. I'm going to just read the last paragraph. The one unimpeachable defense I can offer for these years is that my motive wasn't the worst. I sought neither fame nor fortune, just a more decent world. Right for the big fall, I tumbled vertically into the abyss. After Mao's death in 1977, in short order, his heirs apparent, the Gang of Four, were deposed, and what were called back then the capitalist rotors, targeted by Mao during the Cultural Revolution, seized the reins of power, scrapping the full gamut of Maoist principles and practices. After dreaming for years of a world turned upside down, I stared aghast as China was turned right side up. Although Mao couldn't have been more right that, quote, the bourgeoisie is right inside the party, he couldn't have been more wrong about the methods used to fight it. And although Mao had forewarned that transforming the world was a protracted centuries-long struggle and that there may, might be many setbacks and even counter-revolutions, it still bewildered me how easily everything was undone how much popular support the new capitalist regime garnered, and how reviled Mao's followers were. And the worst blow of all, all for this true-believing, starry-eyed Maoist, how pervasive, if still minuscule by capitalist standards, the personal corruption had been, up to and including Mao. As my good friend Paul Sweezy once said, alas for illusions. Thank you. I come from a slightly different angle. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm told uh, that Vivek Chiba has characterized me as an unrepentant Trotskyist, which is sort of half true and half not true. Um, I, uh, 
come from Britain, where Maoism uh, remained uh, small marginal groups. The difference is essentially the choice which was made by the Trotskyists of the Socialist Workers' Party in the United States not to jump feet first into the uh, radicalising student left uh, uh, of the late 1960s, but to take a degree of distance, whereas uh, the uh, Trotskyists in Britain jumped feet first into the radicalising youth and captured the radicalising youth to the exclusion of the Maoists. Um, but when I read, but when I read uh, Max Elbaum's uh, book on the New Communist Movement, I realised that the uh, organisations of the New Communist Movement were extraordinarily similar uh, to the uh, Socialist Workers' Party of the UK, this is not the same as the SWP of the US, to the International Marxist Group, of which I was a member, to the um, Healy Organisation, Workers' Revolutionary Party, uh, 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 and its associated organisations. Why Maoism, going back to the history, um, my starting point is uh, the marginalisation of Trotskyism. And the marginalisation of Trotskyism, as I understand it, took place uh, because although Trotskyism grew with extraordinary rapidity, quadrupled and multiplied by 10 in size between 1935 and 1940, uh, the uh, uh, 1941 and uh, the... Um, invasion of the Soviet Union and the creation of the Grand Alliance of the uh, United States, the Soviet Union and uh, Great Britain, was the People's Front on a global scale. And because it was the People's, the failures of the People's Front in 1936 to 1940 disappeared. The People's Front on a global scale succeeded and it succeeded all the more when the United States tried in 1947 to take back the cordon sanitaire around Russia, uh, both by, uh, 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 in, in particular, by demanding naval access to the Danube um, and uh, uh, associated activities. And Stalin responded by letting loose the East European Communist parties and also uh, the Communist Party of China and the result was the post-war world uh, of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And the change, Trotsky had said, Stalinism has no ideology, but it's merely obedience to Moscow. And he said that because Stalinism had no victories to claim credit for. Now, after 1949, Stalinism had victories to claim credit for, and it became ideological and polycentric. It became a political ideology based on uh, socialism in one country, national roads to socialism, the People's Front, as opposed to the uh, class politics of the Second International and then of the uh, Trotskyists after that, and the concept of the party monolith. The concept of the party monolith had come into the Trotskyists as well, but it was uh, uh, more clear among uh, the Stalinists. Socialism in one country and national roads had the consequence that this trend, Stalinism slash official communism, became nationalist. And that nationalism produced in turn conflicts among the national regimes. Um, Yugoslavia, the first to try and uh, act independently of the Russians, uh, then Poland and Hungary in the 1950s, then the Sino-Soviet split. And China could not be coerced as the little East European countries uh, could be uh, coerced. And, set out to create its own communist camp. But how was China going to ideologically differentiate itself? In the first phase uh, of the split, um, China differentiated itself around anti-revisionism and around the cult of the personality of Stalin. Uh, but not, that, that was not in itself 
These are both essentially ideologically empty. In the second phase, it appealed to the anti-colonial struggle, and Jerry, I think, rightly talked about the central importance of mass anti-colonial struggles in the 1950s and 1960s to the influence of Maoism. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it could differentiate itself from the USSR as a former colonizing power, and one which, in fact, still held other countries in subordination within the Soviet Union. It could appeal to the peasantry and to peasant revolution. Now, this was not a real differentiation because the Red Victory in 1918 to 21, in reality, took place because the Bolsheviks made their party into the spinal core of a party army which mobilized the peasantry. There was that, in that sense, the difference was simply that the uh, prolonged People's War took place after the seizure of power in the capital rather than before the seizure of power in the capital. Uh, nonetheless, it could be, and this, it, the, both these trends tended to accentuate the theory of the labour aristocracy, the idea that the uh, better organised parts of the working class are better off, are guaranteed to be of the right. And accentuated, we have the idea, the theory of, quote, surrounding the cities, transposed uh, in... Um, the, in, in, in the colonial world to prolong people's war and taking the cities at the end, uh, transposed in uh, the, the imperialist West into the idea of from the periphery to the centre, from race, the unemployed, students, uh, disaffected intelligentsia, uh, to overcoming the, 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 the class question in this way. Um, and uh, the Cultural Revolution, uh, the publication in America of William Hinton's Fan Shen, uh, which was deeply influential, um, the uh, fact that the British were run out of Aden in December 1967 and the success of the Tet Offensive in uh, uh, January, February 1968, showing that the United States attempt to impose order in Vietnam was not working. The consequences, apparent plausibility of Maoism as a package, which represented a radical alternative to mainstream Soviet pop run policy without falling into Trotskyism. Because the underlying idea remained still the People's Front, National Roads, the party monolith. Yeah. And uh, the problem which was going along with that was that actually the People's Front was already becoming absolutely disastrous in the anti-colonial struggles with the failure in Indonesia to prepare for the circumstances of the uh, coup of 1965 uh, with the disasters which affected the two-day party in Iran as a result of the shifting policy of the Soviet Union in relation to the uh, 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 Pahlavi Shah regime, which affected the Communist Party of Iraq as a result of the changing policies of the Soviet Union in relation to the uh, Ba'athists, and, 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 and. Uh, and of course, the Maoists were just as much, China was just as much involved in this. And the uh, change happens. In fact, it happens, uh, Norman talks about it as happening at the moment when the Gang of Four fell, but it was already beginning to happen with Nixon in Beijing, that the, national, the nationalism of national roads and socialism in one country made it possible for the United States to maneuver with China against Russia. And we could already see this. It was already happening with the you know, conspiracy and death of Lin Biao, uh, the change in policy orientation. It materialized in terms of visible practice with the uh, Chinese support for the Chilean coup d'etat of Pinochet in 1973. So it's before Mao's death that China realigned itself geopolitically uh, with the United States. And by the 19, late 1960s, that alignment was also resulting in, also resulted in uh, Chinese support for the um, uh, 
terrorist regime of the uh, Khmer Rouge and uh, Chinese uh, border war uh, with uh, Vietnam uh, and so on. And in this context, uh, it's not just the tendency to splintering of uh, the Maoist uh, organizations, which is shared with the Trotskyist organizations, and indeed is shared with all 1921 Leninist organizations which don't have a police force backing uh, them. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the, uh, 90, the principles of 1921 depend on the operation of the KGB in the background uh, to keep the uh, party together. Mm. That splintering process um, is, uh, uh, but the, it, it is, is not in itself a reason for collapse because the uh, splintering took place in all sorts of other formations, but the collapse which took place of Maoism, Western Maoism, it's not a collapse of colonial world Maoism, but the collapse of Western Maoism flows from the geopolitical reorientation of Beijing, which made uh, the idea of uh, uh, Beijing as offering a revolutionary alternative to the Soviet Union uh, delusive. What remains behind uh, is the ideas of, uh, from the periphery to the center, the rejection of class politics, uh, the development of privilege theory, and indeed, actually, the, the concept of the party monolith um, it expresses itself in the form of, uh, quote, what we used to call political correctness, and then it's become called wokeness, and the... Uh, 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 right wing have made wokeness into an enemy, etc., etc., etc. But in reality, uh, it's still uh, a dogmatic that uh, every political difference has to express some uh, class difference, some difference in interest, which makes it impossible to have unity and makes it impossible to have. Uh, a discussion of strategy and differences on strategy and tactics which can uh, uh, lead anywhere. So that's all I have to say. Um, so I think I am perhaps somewhat uh, somewhat differenced from, from the rest of the panel, you might even say, uh, perhaps to a degree contradicted uh, with with the rest of the panel, in that I um, approach these questions not from a sort of uh, uh, I might even say it's not from an autopsy perspective, but from a Maoist perspective, and from a Maoist perspective in the present, from a perspective of Maoism not as this historical event from from 1927 to 1976, but from a perspective of, of Maoism as a thing that there is in the world today. Um, that continues to be relevant, continues to be important, in, in my opinion, centrally important to the to the historic his future historical trajectory, which I guess future historical may be a confusing phrase, but the future historical trajectory of um, the communist movement and of the global working class. I think maybe the single most important point to make in defining like what is Maoism, what does that mean from the perspective of I won't say any because there's a lot of weirdos out there, but from any serious, from any important um, political organization organizing and calling itself Maoist today, from, for instance, any of the um, several political parties currently leading uh, uh, guerrilla warfare to wage socialist revolution in their own countries, um, for instance, the, the CPI Maoist, the so-called Naxalites or Naxalites uh, in India, what does Maoism mean to them? Um, I think the key thing is that it is not this one period that happened in China and, all, and, and then imitation of that. It's not, it's not just that. Maoism doesn't just mean um, this thing that happened and maybe some Americans dressing up like it and, and trying to copy it exactly. Maoism is a current of thought. It is a philosophical viewpoint. It is an ideology, um, which 
has developed as communist ideology has always developed, as it continues to develop, as it has, you know, as ideology has always emerged in class struggle from the very beginning. Uh, and I would echo what, what uh, you said about um, kind of Mao's writings on this, on contradiction and on practice. Great essays talk about how ideology is born in struggle. Um, Mao, so Maoism is an ideological system, and it isn't even necessarily born, finished, fully formed in China with, with, you know, with the establishment of the PRC in, in 1949, I believe. I have that written down. Yes, 49, and with socialism in the 50s, uh, uh, and with the development of the key sort of Maoist theory that um, contradictions of capitalism continue to... They don't exist as they exist under capitalism, but they create a kind of an imprint upon a socialist society. When you've built a socialist society, when you've gotten rid of the base of capitalism, um, you continue to have some of the superstructural things it has produced. You continue to have some of its attitudes. And this is why any political economic revolution not only um, creates a new pol political economic mode, a new mode of production, but once it has done that, creates its own new revolutionary uh, uh, cultural superstructure, an ideological superstructure to support itself, which is the purpose of the theory of the cultural revolution. Um, that's a beginning. What that is is the, the development of the necessary ideas to apply Marxism-Leninism to China. Um, I would argue, I know this is a very, a very controversial thing to say, I would argue with, with phenomenal success, with devastating success, you know, you have 25, 30 years of socialism. You can go and read Fan Shen. Um, you have a country where people that um, were, were peasants who couldn't read, who didn't have, literally had genuinely no free time, barely any concept of, of freedom. They're entirely beholden to landlords and bureaucrat capitalists. Um, women were effectively property of their husbands and their husbands' bosses. You go from that to a country where these same people are enabled to, to flourish and to own the means of production they work and to control their own labor power, and they are discussing philosophy in public. They are democratically governing the factories in which they work. You know, they are, they are creating theater. They are creating music. Um, I think it's hard to argue that that's not wonderful. Um, it was destroyed, yes, because this theory of the Cultural Revolution comes around too late. Um, to, to stop, you know, the plot of people like, uh, uh, they were named earlier as the capitalist rotors. The actual individual names of two of the biggest leaders of that are um, Huo Guofeng and Deng Xiaoping. Um, Deng Xiaoping took over the country after Mao. Huo, Huo Guofeng was his friend. Um, they were very bad guys. Uh, they killed among others, Zhang Qing, Zhang Chungqiao, I've written some of these names down, uh, Wang Hongwen, these are, these are the, the communist leaders in the party that are sort of marched out of their offices on trumped up charges and, and thrown in prison um, after Mao's death in 73, and then they are, they are finally removed in 76. Um, but, but Maoism didn't die there and didn't end there, and in fact it hadn't even fully formed there, you know, because you have these ideas that are created to apply Marxism-Leninism to China are then taken um, to other places. I've written, the way I've kind of formulated my notes, which I won't be able to read all of, uh, is kind of a history of Maoism in four essential organizations, because okay, that's the Communist Party of China, right? Communist Party of China, revolution, socialism, and the coup against socialism from 27 to 76. Uh, you then have a group of radicals in a country that is in some ways very similar to China and in some ways very different um, in Peru, in South America, um, under the leadership of, again, in my, in my own Maoist view, acknowledging this is controversial, a very great philosopher, a very great leader of the working people uh, who also died sadly in prison two years ago. Um, Abimael Guzman, known by the nom de guerre uh, Gonzalo, the chairman of the Communist Party of Peru, um, which was known uh, uh, um, insultingly, they never called themselves this, as the Sendero Luminoso, uh, or the Shining Path, um, began a protracted people's war, a revolutionary war to establish socialism in Peru uh, in 1980 
again under the guidance of these ideas they had taken from China. And they said these ideas um, are not just the application of Marxism and Leninism to China, which is what Mao himself said. Mao never talked about Maoism. Mao talked about Mao Zedong thought as the application of, um, of Marxism and Leninism, which is at the time was what it was. Uh, under the leadership of Gonzalo, these people of the, the um, Communist Party of Peru and of mass organizations in the United Front around it, like the uh, Movimiento Popular de Peru um, and, and its military organization, the, the um, People's Guerrilla Army, say, well, we've further refined these ideas in struggle, actually, in the, again, in the way Mao describes. Um, we've further refined these ideas in struggle, these ideas of cultural revolution, of um, uh, a cutting Maoist analysis of how semi-colonialism as the modern mode of imperialism together with semi-feudalism works, of uh, how to struggle out differences within a party, of how to build a united front, and, and uh, how to organize mass line leadership. These are some of, I would say, the key theoretical lessons of, of Maoism. Um, and this has developed a third stage in the development of the guiding ideology of the dialectical struggle to overcome the contradictions of capitalist imperialism and build a communist society. Uh, that is the idea that emerges in 1982 in Peru with the communists there, not in China. Um, and so, so, you know, effectively they say you have Marxism developed, then you have the dialectical problem of applying that to Russia, you know, the resolution of that contradiction was the development of a second stage, Marxism-Leninism. Then we have the application of Marxism-Leninism in places like China and places like Peru. Uh, uh, the resolution of that contradiction develops a new ideology of the proletariat for the 20th and the 21st century, which is the, the launching of Maoism as the ideology of the proletariat. Marxism-Leninism-Maoism as the ideology of the proletariat. Um, uh, which I argue essentially continues as the ideology of the revolutionary proletariat to the present day. And that's kind of, I know I'm not a member of Platypus, but I'm a, a friend of the Santa Cruz chapter, and you guys have been very nice to me. And I'm wearing my little button uh, uh, in, in friendliness. So there's no, there's no big hard feelings, but I have the statement of purpose in front of me. And the, the Platypus society is effectively built on this assumption that um, you know, the left is dead, long live the left. The, the, the way I, I was describing in a conversation with someone, with someone earlier is the idea that there's been this slump. Um, no one is doing the revolution anymore. What happened? We need to all stop and pause and figure it out. And I kind of don't think that that's true. Um, I think the, the point I would make as my central thesis is that that is not true. Um, the ideology of the proletariat and of the revolutionary communist, communist movement, which is the movement of its most advanced part for its global liberation and for the liberation of humanity um, continues to exist today. And there are communist parties all over the world um, waging the struggle in that. Uh, uh, again, in the 1980s, this is the third organization on my little list, there was the organization of what was the first, I believe, in 1984, the first serious attempt at creating a kind of communist international after the collapse of the Comintern. Um, and of, of the, the Trotskyists, the Fourth International, was the, the Revolutionary Internationalist Movement in 1984, which included the Revolutionary Communist Party in America, it included the PCP in Peru, the CPI Maoist in India, a number of these organizations. Um, it fell apart because Avakian, this is a very short version, Avakian, uh, the leader of the, the RCP in America, came in, is, is not, uh, crazy, and <laughs> came into contradiction with the, the genuine leadership, the red leadership, and it dissolved. Um, but as recently as last year, you have the formation of the International Communist League um, in, I think they went to Spain for their, for their founding Congress, of um, a number of Maoist organizations around the world, some of which are very small, some of which I'm sure you can say are unimportant. You know, nobody cares what the, what the communist, Maoist Communist Party of the French state is doing. Okay, I can, I can accept that. But in, you, know, you have involved with this, with this organization um, two parties that are actively waging the revolution in their country, the TKPML in Turkey, the PCP in Peru. And with Peru especially, there's been a lot of like, um, you know, Fujimorista propaganda. 
to get you to think there's some kind of crazy drug, drug terrorist gang uh, that they cut off people's heads, that they boil people, or whatever. Um, no, 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 I would so highly. So you, I, you can just try to wind up. Yes, I would highly encourage you to be skeptical about all of that. But my point is, you have organizations all over the world: um, Peru, Turkey, India, um, the Philippines. Um, leading communist revolution, and you have many more in Brazil, in uh, Ecuador, in uh, Norway, making real strides to prepare for it. Um, I think that that is a testament that the, li the, the communist movement is a living militant movement today, and it is a Marxist, Leninist, Maoist movement, is my thesis, I guess. <laughs> that you didn't get enough time. If, if so, you could take a few extra minutes, but everyone's going to get three minutes to respond to the okay. presentations. Uh, and I'll be a little uh, more lenient with you if there was some miscommunication. So three minutes to respond from each panel, so then we're going to open it up for Q&A. Great. Uh, thank all the panelists for the contributions. Uh, I would just, again, uh, a couple things. One, I would, again, stress uh, theory and practice. There's no, you can't just form a study group and figure things out. You gotta be involved in the mass movement. You gotta be out there organizing. Uh, and think about your experiences in mass organizing and how that's reflected in your theory as a dialectical relationship. Uh, number two, the most important thing to think about, well, I'm an internationalist and all this stuff is interesting, is still the American experience. That's the country we have to change. Uh, and you have to, we have to get in touch with our experiences and our culture and, uh, and our history uh, as the major focus of our thinking. Um, and uh, uh, so when it comes to uh, China, I mean, I, I didn't talk much about Mao's contributions uh, in particular, so let me just spend one or two minutes on that. Um, you know, before the 1949 culmination of the revolution, his main contributions were understanding of the peasant base rather than a proletarian base, and his writings on guerrilla warfare. I don't think those are applicable to America. They may be still applicable in some of countries in the global south. Um, I think his ideas on the united front are still very important and often overlooked. Uh, for example, unite all those who can be united, aim the main blow at the most reactionary, and defeat your enemies one by one. I think that's applicable to America today, where we face who is the main enemy in America today. I would say the white supremacy neo-fascist movement, and we have to unite all those who can be united against that movement to aim our main blow there. Um, the uh, new democracy was an application of the United Front to socialism, similar to uh, Lenin and Bukharin's new economic policy. Uh, again, not particularly applicable to where we are here in the United States. Mao's mass line, I think, is important to the masses and from the masses. Again, a dialectical understanding of the relationship of theory and practice. Um, and for the Cultural revolution, for all of its problems, uh, one thing that Mao and folks around him tried to uh, get to an understanding is that in a one-party system, if that party becomes corrupt, the whole project goes down the drain. Uh, and so uh, Mao, during the Cultural Revolution, helped to form uh, power centers outside the Communist Party in his understanding of democracy. Uh, but the, the attacks became much too widespread. Uh, so you had people who had dedicated their entire lives to the revolutionary movement in China being imprisoned uh, and being repressed, uh, and we can't ignore that. The best thing that they didn't do was widespread executions, like under Stalin, uh, where they just took, you know, probably 800 to 900,000 people and executed them. That didn't happen in China during the Cultural Revolution. Nonetheless, there was a lot of repression that we have to understand went on in the Cultural Revolution. 
Um, we thought it was great when I was a student. I, yeah, send our teachers, send our professors out to pig farms and have them, uh, you know, feed the pigs and understand what it is to be like a working class or a per person for three or four years. Yeah, we thought well, that was great. And actually, that there's some validity to some of that too. But uh, I think, uh, lastly, that Mao's problem here was um, his strengths are his weaknesses, which is true for all of us, because our strengths often cover up what we don't understand. So Mao always believed in the objective will of the masses could overcome objective conditions. That was true in organizing the peasant base to overthrow imperialism and comprador capitalism. But that wasn't true in the Great Leap Forward, where he thought that, that you could ignore the objective conditions of the economic base and just, you know, uh, melt down all the steel and, the, you know, and create an industrial revolution out of farm equipment. It was ridiculous. The uh, subjective forces failed. Uh, and in the Cultural Revolution, that was the same thing. Just massive mobilization of people could overcome the objective conditions that were holding back the revolution. Um, that in the final analysis also failed. So those are the things that we have to deal with. The fig, not, not only the good points, but also why the failures. So for all the strong points of Maoism, why did Maoism fail in China? Although, well, I'll just leave it there. As I said at the very beginning, there are many lessons to be learned from that experience. Unfortunately, at least for myself, uh, those lessons are overwhelmingly negative. If I were to ask you what's the most important lesson on a personal level from that experience is something that I learned several years later reading John Stuart Mill when he said, you may know everything about your side of an argument but if you don't know the other side, then you don't really know anything. So, when I was roughly the age of most people in this room, I was and continued to be a voracious reader. I sat down and read everything there was to read about China. I knew, something, I knew, as, I knew enough that as an undergraduate, I was appointed as a preceptor on China because I knew more than most of my professors. However, I only knew my side. Whenever I read the other side, I dismissed that as bourgeois or heady bourgeois propaganda. So it took me a long time to realize that you don't have a monopoly on truth, namely myself. Uh, no ideology has a monopoly on truth and that you have to listen to the other side, which might serve as an important corrective. Having said that, are there things you know, quite impressive about China? Well, as I said, yes. The answer has to be yes. As I said at the beginning of my remarks, the uh, transformation of China from what, as we knew it growing up, growing up, China projected two images to the Western world. There were just two. One was the Chinese coolie back broken, pulling the rickshaw of the British gentleman. That was one image. Image two was China was the land of famine. Now, say what you want about China today. I think we can all agree those two images are no longer representative of China. And that transformation occurred in the course of the 20th century. And the bridge that connected the sick man of Asia to the global superpower soon to supersede the United States, the bridge connecting the two. It's called, it just is three letters, it's called Mao. You may not like to hear that, but that to me is an irrefutable fact that Mao Zedong bridged that transformation in China. Having said that, now my pitch to the people in this room. You're facing young people, of which I assume is mostly constituted. You're facing three big challenges. You all know them. Climate change, nuclear war, which is very real now, and getting realer day by day, and an economy that's failing for about 80% of the people, and because it's failing not yet at the level of the Great Depression, 
but certainly for 80% of the people in our country, they're not seeing any future. It's a futureless future. And unfortunately for your generation, you have a, a time limit. You can't wait until the infinite future because there may not be a future. So I think the real challenge for you folks, yes, you should read some of Mao. I know his collected works now are about, what's been assembled is about nine volumes, and if I live long enough, we may sit down and look at them. Uh, but you have to focus on trying to find the solutions to those questions, and I'm going to just leave on a hopeful note. Most of you in this room, I suppose, have read the Communist Manifesto. Uh, Jordan Peterson was once asked to debate Slavo Zizek on Marxism, and he very proudly said, in order to prepare for this debate, I read the Communist Manifesto, which I thought told you a lot about the intellectual standards of our time. Uh, but nonetheless, there is an interesting line, the Communist Manifesto, which most of you will probably remember. Marx says, at the point where revolution seems plausible, possible, hopeful, at that moment, a section of bourgeois intellectuals break off from their class and join the struggle. And that's why people like Lenin, who was of noble birth, Rosa Luxemburg, a spectacular intellect, uh, they all broke, and Trotsky, they all broke off from their class and joined the struggle. Why do I mention it? Because for me, speaking as an old timer, the most hopeful thing about platypus, the whole, most hopeful thing about your generation, or one of the most hopeful things, is you all come from, I think we could say, relatively privileged backgrounds. You come from the University of Chicago. I met a man, a young man on the plane yesterday, casually mentions to me he's at University of Pennsylvania, and my friend Oliver from NYU, brilliant minds, actually quite more impressive than my own at that, gen at that age. And I, for a moment, it occurred to me, we're seeing it now. We're seeing that break off of bourgeois, privileged people, intellectuals, and that to me is a glimpse that maybe there is a revolutionary possibility now. Uh, because in my generation, Mao was for mostly imbeciles and morons. I mean, we have to be honest about that. Um, so, yeah, so uh, uh, I, I, remain, I, I am hopeful by this conference, the fact that so many of you came out early in the morning to attend, uh, that gives me hope that maybe something is happening here. As the song had it in the 1960s, there's something, something happening here. Thank you. Um, I have just some responses to uh, things that the other speakers have said, uh, for which thanks uh, to um, Jerry. Uh, I think that it's the common feature of the Maoists and the Trotskyists that the various different groups try to go direct to the masses in order, because it's not just Mao who says theory can only be theory in connection with practice, but you go directly to the masses. And you go directly to the masses and you find yourselves uh, saying very much the same thing as the good trade union organisers of the uh, social democratic right, of the old communist party, of the other competing organisations. Yeah. And uh, there is a sense in which actually the tendency towards sectarianism and splintering is not just produced by uh, the uh, forms of 1921, organizational forms of 1921, and the belief that the class struggle takes place within the party as well as outside. It's also produced by the effort to get to the masses. And Trotsky made this comment in 1931, actually, in relation to debate in the German Trotskyist movement, that it's frequently a uh, it's frequently believed that internal democracy is a waste of time because you need to get out there and go to the masses. And if you don't go to the masses, you can't 
um, developed theory. But the problem with that is actually you wind up with, you don't develop theory, you dumb everybody down, precisely by the point that Norman makes that you're hearing only one side of the argument because you're throwing out the guys who are dissenting on the basis that they're wasting time engaging in permanent factionalism, etc., etc., etc. My second point is just to Norman in relation to Lenin the murderer. Um, I think if you're going to say Lenin the murderer, you have to be willing to say George Washington the murderer and uh, um, uh, the Earl of Halifax and the other guys who invited uh, the Dutch invasion of England in 1688, the murderers, and um, the uh, people who cut off the head of uh, Charles I, uh, the murderers. And uh, it's that, that's the problem with the, the um, straight liberalism, because the reality is that the liberal also, in fact, uh, celebrates the use of force. Uh, and we have been living since the Carter administration uh, in uh, a world of bombs which fall on uh, the uh, primarily third world countries, but more recently, actually, uh, uh, second world countries. Uh, in the name of human rights and humanitarian intervention. And so there, I think, irrespective of what one thinks about um, uh, the uh, Red Terror and uh, the uh, Maoist Terror and uh, the Great Leap Forward, one cannot say uh, that the liberal solution to that uh, works because uh, the, 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 the judicial power which decides whether what the killing is murder or whether it's uh, an exercise of judicial power uh, assumes the right uh, to kill uh, in exactly the same way as the guys who we characterise as murderous uh, revolutionaries assume uh, the right to kill. And so that was my uh, second point, and that's it. Uh, all righty, hello again. Um, I suppose I'll, I'll sort of jump on the, on the topic of theory and practice, that contradiction, uh, that dichotomy, because I think it is a very, a very important one. And it's also one that um, comes up uh, quite a lot in Mao's own philosophy. Um, like it's pretty, it's pretty central, I think, for Mao's understanding of dialectical materialism and how you apply it to a problem. Is that is that um, you practice in the world, you come in contradiction with things and resolve the contradictions through practice, and that creates ideas in your head which you then refine through more struggle in your head so that you can then apply them to the next problem. So it's this kind of neither rationalism nor empiricism, but a kind of a, a I guess, a resolution of the contradiction between the two in a way. Um, because you know ideas come from practice and are refined in the mind and then are returned to practice. And they are good because they work in practice. And if they don't, then they're not. And that, in general, I think that's a really good idea, really key point. Um, what makes an idea a good idea? It works. That uh, wheels are a good idea. A triangle wheel is a pretty bad idea. Why? It has nothing to do with the, the character of the like neuron firing in your brain. It's because the thing this idea leads you to make is a thing that works. Um, and one of the, the questions in the actual prompt is why has, has Maoism had such appeal? And, and um, the question is phrased very much in terms of like the, the 1970s, the, the past, but this is an international convention as I understand it. So if we talk about like the globe, I think it's a question that should be asked in the present tense. Why does, why does Maoism have such um, present tense appeal? Why is it that millions of peasants in Brazil um, can be uh, mobilized by the Liga dos Camponeses Pobres with the idea of a new democratic revolution. Um, and I should say that that's not, a Mao not an explicitly Maoist organization, but um, proudly supported 
by the, the Brazilian Communist Party Red Faction and other members of the International Communist League? Um, I think the answer is because Maoism works, dog. Uh, we have, wow, that, that's okay. That, if nothing else, I, I made some people laugh, I guess. Um, we have, uh, uh, you know, revolutionary guerrilla war being waged in, in um, Turkey, in Peru, in the Philippines, in all these places. We have, and the idea is that these are tiny fringe groups, they're not important. But um, both the Indian government and the Filipino government are pretty terrified right now because the CPI Maoist and the Communist Party of the Philippines have gotten a lot bigger than they were since the late 90s and in the early 2000s. They're bigger now than they were then because capitalism is in crisis. And people go, hey, if I join the CPI Maoist, they'll give me a job. And, and let me own the means of production that I work on. That's pretty swag. Um, you know, we can look at real material concrete results of these revolutionary movements and how they're making life better for the proletariat and the peasantry. Uh, in the Philippines, it's a very conservative country. If you're gay, you can't get married, except in the areas controlled by the Communist Party. That's cool. Um, uh, India, big problem with, with sex tourism, with trafficking. Uh, wealthy capitalists from the first world, and they, they come, this is bringing the tone to a much less funny place, um, they come from places like the U.S., they go to, to states in the rural southern part of the country um, where the police force doesn't really care, and there's a lot of villages in the jungle, and the age of consent is very low, and, and they patronize prostitutes, um, and these are women who have, I think, about the worst life you can imagine. Um, and the CPI Maoist and its, its um, associated military wing, the, um, the PLGA, the People's Liberation Guerrilla Army, have taken strong steps against this. They've eradicated this practice in entire villages. Um, I think in 2021, 20, I want to say, there was a big news story out of India about an attack on a t hotel involved in trafficking. So if you want to talk about theory and practice, this is the theory being applied to the practice and working. Um, in a more concrete way than I see coming from Trotskyism, than I see coming from anarchism, than I see coming from whatever other trajectory you want to name that has split off from this broad idea we call the left. Um, I don't know if I have a, a time to address other points. We could get to some questions. Okay, let's do that then. We've got just over 36 minutes, so there's probably going to be time for much more than three or four questions. So I'll take questions, and I want to prioritize the uh, comrades and uh, members and uh, guests we have here, and I'll start over here. Uh, Roy Lederson from the Socialist Workers' Party, and uh, I want to comment on Filipino males, which I have some experience with. But first, I want to make a quick point about the Maoism in China is actually Stalinism from the counter-revolution against Lenin's proletarian internationalism and Bolshevism in the Russian Revolution imported to China. It was, it was the defeats in 1937 that brought um, Mao to the fore in the, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and just quickly on the, the, the question of the Cultural Revolution and the disaster in Indonesia, these are deeply connected in a way that most people don't realise. There's a pamphlet we have called Maoism versus Bolshevism by one of the leaders of the Socialist Workers Party who closely followed this. And he pointed out that the, the, the second biggest defeat of the international working class in history after these, the, the Stalinism allowed, uh, split the German working class and allowed Hitler to come to power was the disaster in Indonesia. Um, you know, some of the speakers have, have, have spoken to this. But it was the, the internal ructions in the, in the Chinese Communist Party in the wake of this, and Mao mobilised the Red Guard movement in, to fight against his factional rivals in the CP. And then he took the army against the, the Red Guard when they got out of control. We should never forget that. You know, the brutal anti-working class methods of the Red Guard. OK, but in the Philippines, very quickly, um, I, I totally disagree that the, that the, Mao, the Maoist movement is on the rise in, in, in the Philippines. It's, it's been weakened through splits, and it's, it's a diminished force, although it's still predominant. Uh, but we, we have, we have uh, collaboration with some people who have, uh, and have broke away from the, the, the CPP, 
and they were asked by Matt and Mouse there, well, you say that the prolonged people's war in the countryside is, is, uh, is not the, this the revolutionary strategy. Where can you point to a revolution that has not followed that path? And our, our friend said, the Cuban revolution, because Fidel Castro and the Cuban revolution organised to bring workers and peasants to power as rapidly as possible. We have a pamphlet out there, Fidel, in, in, on, uh, uh, in Colombia, which deals with this. Thank you. Okay. Anybody want to take that question on the panel? We're going to take them one at a time. Um, I mean, I think it was kind of directed about, at me, yes. I'm, I'm the one that brought up Mike, the please, Mike, 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 Mike. Uh, well, I, ass I assume that's directed at me because I'm the one that brought up uh, the Philippines. Um, in the first place, on the, on the idea that Maoism has imported Stalinism, there is no such thing as Stalinism. Um, Stalinism does not describe anything clearly. Stalinism does not describe a, a, um, a current of thought as such. It is a, a rude name for the way Stalin governed, um, which, okay, you can call the way Stalin governed Stalinism if you want, and, and I guess we have Bushism and Bidenism and all these isms, but I don't think that's a very useful terminology. Um, and yes, uh, uh, Mao, certainly admired Stalin. Mao certainly saw Stalin as a great leader of the working class, which is what he was. Um, Stalin was, was a, a vital ideological leader um, during the defeat of fascism. Uh, good for him. He also made pretty terrible mistakes as the leader of the Soviet Union, um, and we should be critical of him. Uh, Mao's teaching was that, on average, in general, as a loose rubric, a past communist leader that we uphold, a person like Stalin, uh, is 70% a good legacy, 30% contradictions we should resolve by improving our own line. That's the line I would take on Stalin. It's also the line I would take on Mao. Um, as to is the, the movement in the Philippines growing, it's not me saying that, it is the government saying that. The Filipino government is saying that. They're very frightened. This is why they are escalating their arrests of activists. This is why they recently murdered five people in Nubataang uh, just for saying that indigenous people should have schools because that's something the Communist Party also thinks. Um, the, the, we are at a point where the, the problem is so significant in the eyes of the Filipino government that they are paying for an organization called the NTF LCAC to come here to this country to go to Filipino immigrant communities and to effectively um, propagandize to get them not to believe in the communist revolution. It's, it's such a significant threat that the Filipino government, despite you know, being a very small government, not having a huge budget, um, needs to make its propaganda movement against it global. So I think that that is very telling and very significant. Yeah, yeah just really briefly. The, the guerrilla wars in the Philippines and India and Peru are all peasant-based, rural, uh, revolutionary movements that have almost no relevance to what we have to do here in the United States. So what we need to discuss is what the hell we're going to do here. It's, you know, that's, that's all. I mean, get straight on what is relevant for the American Revolution, and that's where our thinking needs to focus. I agree. I would not, just, not say just the American Revolution. It was also the case the guerrilla war systematically failed in Argentina, Bolivia, uh, and indeed actually in Peru. It's a, it is exactly, it's a strategy for mobilizing the peasantry uh, in countries which are dominated by a pre-capitalist peasantry. If you could, a, a, a capitalist small farmer uh, class doesn't have the same political dynamics. It's, you have to have pre-capitalist peasantry, pre-capitalist landlord class, etc., etc., etc. Okay. Uh, the Philippines government thinks that there's a serious threat to the Filipino Communist Party. The British government thinks there's a terrible threat of uh, uh, the expansion of trans ideology, uh, which turns out, uh, in terms of the last year's British census, to be 0.5% of people uh, self-identifying as trans. So why does the British government say that there's a terrible threat of the growth of trans ideology? It's a culture wars operation. 
And in the same way, it's very likely that the Filipino government saying this terrible threat of Maoism is actually an excuse for cracking down on uh, all sorts of oppositional activity uh, in the Philippines uh, uh, by uh, being the, the, the bad, the, these are the bad guys. Stalinism, we, CBGB, we usually talk now about official communism, but it's certainly the case that there came to be an ideological trend based on socialism in one country, national roads to socialism, the People's Front as the method of getting there, and the concept of the party as the party monolith. That ideological trend, it's convenient to call it Stalinism, because in terms of how it emerged, it emerged in the factional struggles within the Russian Communist Party. And um, that was that struggles. It, it, we wound up Stalinism versus Trotskyism, but that's merely because most of the guys who were in opposition to that, uh, including Zinoviev, Kamenev, uh, Bukharin, etc., etc., were all liquidated. And, Trotsky was the last survivor until 1940. That's it. Norm, did you want to respond to that, or should we take another question? Okay. Yeah, thank you for your presentations. So, um, Comandante Gonzalo, otherwise known as Dr. Abimael Guzman, who was a philosophy professor in Ayacucho, uh, who organized a student group to teach about Kant and Hegel and the tradition of German idealism, wrote in 1987 in his notes on philosophy that without philosophy, there is no party. Um, CJ, you presented the issue of theory as that which comes directly from practice, and yet here in this, for what you're saying, meaningful organization in the transformation of Maoism, um, Guzman seems to suggest that the Maoists need philosophy, that they need to think, that they need theory. He has a critique of Althusser that he presents. And my question is, why do you need philosophy to organize the protracted people's war? What do you get from theory? How does it help you meet your mission? Um, so why do we need philosophy if you're a Maoist? Yeah, again, I mean, it, it, it's not just for you. I think there are others who addressed it, but you can start off. Please. Sorry, I don't mean to, I don't know, I don't mean to um, domineer the microphone. Obviously, there are other people that have a lot more, a lot more uh, erudition and knowledge than I do. Um, so Lenin also said uh, revolutionary movement depends upon its revolutionary theory. I think that that is true. I think what um, Gonzalo said is true. I think what Mao said about theory emerging from practice and being applied to practice is also true. I don't see a contradiction between philosophy and practice. Um, philosophy, I think, is a, a very wiggly word. Um, people are unsure what it means. It means different things to different people. I myself uh, am a big fan of philosophy. I like philosophy. Um, but there are different areas of philosophy. And there's different ways of doing philosophy. There are bourgeois ways to do it, and there are proletarian ways to do it. But um, what it really means is understanding the world, how we move in the world, how we understand the world, and how we change the world. Uh, that's precisely what Marxism is for. Marxism, and again today, and Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, is a philosophical system for guiding a struggle that has emerged from that struggle and that returns to that struggle and guides it. Um, yeah, I don't see a separation between philosophy and ideas that emerge from material practice. Philosophy is ideas that emerge from material practice. Allow me. Oh, sorry. I'm not going to address the specific question of Mr. Guzman, who I consider a wholesale irrelevance. But there is a broader question, and that's the question which I think plagues, not so much plagues, it's a problem confronting your generation and how you create a unifying ideology 
that will be able to, as Mao Zedong used to say, unite the many to defeat the few. How do you create unifying ideology in your generation? We've sort of regressed, I don't want to say regressed, we've gone back to a kind of competitive capitalism model, model where you see there's this proliferation of 10,000 different journals, 10,000 different sects. I was asking Ethan on the plane on the way over, have you ever heard of the Mars Review? He said no. Have you ever heard of the Drift? He said no. Have you ever heard of Compact? Yes. Uh, there are so many journals, so many ideologies, and as you like to call it, it's so eclectic. And uh, that obviously has its value. That's how truth is found, the so-called marketplace of ideas. But it has its disadvantage, which is there's no unifying ideology which can organize people. Why do you need philosophy? So let me begin with just a small anecdote. I was for a long time quite close friends with Professor Chomsky. And once in a while, the question of what you call the dialectic comes up. And he was always very dismissive of the idea of dialectic. He would say, oh, that's just hocus pocus. That's just, he used to call Marxism a chapter in the history of organized religion. And he was very dismissive. I was a little bit more skeptical of his response. Because when you read the great thinkers, and nobody can, dis uh, nobody can dis deny they were great thinkers, when you uh, read Lenin, you read Trotsky, you read Rosa Luxemburg, and Chomsky has a warm spot in his heart for Rosa Luxemburg, um, they're all very convinced, they're very convinced the idea of the dialectic does help them understand reality. And in fact, they are fully convinced that if you don't have that under dialectical, as they call it, understanding of reality, uh, you are at a serious political, not to mention ideological, disadvantage. So it's very hard for me to believe that this concept could be just all hocus pocus when such uh, formidable minds found it of practical value. And so I have to say to myself, yes, there has to be an element of ideology, an element of so-called philosophy in any kind of revolutionary outlook on the world. How helpful the dialectic is nowadays, I can't say, but certainly back then it seemed to have been a formidable mental weapon for people of quite uh, impressive uh, uh, mental capacity. Uh, the second thing I would want to say is the problem when a philosophy becomes rigidified uh, or becomes dogmatic. And here I think there's a contradiction which is inescapable in the real world. The contradiction is quite simple. In order to organize a revolutionary movement, in order to inspire people, you have to have a certain degree of, not a certain degree, you have to have certitude. You have to really believe that what you believe is the true belief. Why? Because how many people are willing to give away their lives, not just the whole of their lives, but give away just a fraction of their lives because they're going to die in the course of struggle. How many people are willing to give their lives for something which may be true, but maybe not be true? It can't happen that way. And so I was reading the other week, last week as it is, I was reading uh, Trotsky's book, The Young Lenin. And he says, he notes that one of Lenin's adversaries said, Lenin can't be a true scientist because he was so dogmatic. He believed Marxism had all the answers and that he was able to process Marxism and produce all the correct answers. And Trotsky was very dismissive of this criticism. He says, oh, this guy is just a Philistine who wants to make, justify hesitancy, justify doubt. And I had to think both sides were right. Lenin is right. Without certitude, you're not going to get people to give their lives for a cause. But on the other hand, any rational person understands that as certain as any of your beliefs might be, you always have to entertain the doubt that you might be wrong. Either of you? Um, 
Yeah. Next as, question. As fast as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, my name is CJ. Um, let's see, I'll try to say this as quickly as possible. Um, let's see, but uh, Norman, you were saying that um, you felt, uh, what's the word, like overwhelmed in a sense of this uh, quote of like, dare to struggle, dare to win. Um, Mike, you were also, maybe similarly to CJ, um, CJ was saying that um, Stalinism means nothing, right? And Mike McNair, earlier you also said similarly that Stalinism has no ideology, right? So I think. In a sense, there's also a commonality between the two. And Jerry, you were saying that um, the core of Maoism um, are these two pieces of on practice and on contradiction, um, and that the core of it is really this matter of correct or false, or like good or bad line, right? And it's a matter of line change, right? Um, so in my hometown of Austin, uh, we worked with an uh, organization called Red Guards, uh, which later became, or became the Committee to Reconstitute the Communist Party of the USA. Um, so there, there's a lot of similarities there. Um, and one of the pieces that they wrote, um, Contra Adornus Aesthetic and Politics, um, I just want to read from really quickly. In, in, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, essentially, more or less the idea is, in this idea of line change, I was wondering if, if reflection is possible, similarly to Pam's question, um, in which if you're, there is a reflection on one's own history of um, their movement and the reflection of one's own practice, right? Um, if the idea already latent behind it, right, is that the line was bad, or that the line was incorrect, can reflection really go beyond that? Under my or under my spot. Uh, Jerry or Mike, since you didn't ask the answer the last one, would you like to start us off? Okay. Um, I, I think you have to go outside your own experience to understand broader reality. So understanding, developing a correct line is always a work in progress, and it's always broader than your small group or your individual experience, and I think Mao understood that. I would just say also that I think Antonio Gramsci is more relevant to American conditions than Mao Zedong, and that we would do well if you want to study philosophy is to look at Gramsci uh, and get involved with his philosophy and ideas, uh, not to ignore Mao, but to spend more time with Gramsci. I said that Trotsky said that Stalinism has no ideology. And then I went on to say that after the victories of 1941 to 49, Stalinism did have an ideology. Uh, that is to say, socialism in one country, people's roads, people's fronts, uh, 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 the, 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 the party monolith. On uh, the uh, underlying question, it's a, there's a point which Marx makes somewhere in the Grundrisse, uh, and which is, gets cited over and over again, which is that the analysis starts with the concrete as an untheorized form, and then proceeds by abstraction uh, to an, at the analysis of what's going on, and the concrete as an un, uh, 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 in, in abstraction from the concrete, and then proceeds from there to work up uh, the concrete as a combination of abstractions. That is to say that we have to have the moment of abstraction, the moment of theorization, is as essential to the process as is the immediate experiential, the immediate response to uh, experience. And there I agree with Jerry, you have to go outside of your own immediate experience uh, on this. Um, uh, how can we unite? We have to unite on the basis of a political platform not on the basis of uh, common agreement on philosophy, not on the basis of common agreement on uh, the detail of theory, not on the basis of ideology. But that is, I'm not going to, that's opening a whole bloody can of worms, so I'm going to leave it at that. Anybody now? Uh, so I'll firstly briefly say, just because he's been mentioned, that I am also a big Gramsci fan. 
Uh, although I don't think Gramsci is an alternative to Maoism, I think Gramsci could be a great uh, guidestone in implementing uh, the lessons of the Cultural Revolution in the future. I think that they, they complement each other. But anyway, in, re in response to the question, um, I think one of the great strengths and one of the great advancements of Maoism in the field of Marxism is its application of dialectical materialism as a philosophy and of the idea of how essentially the universe evolves through the interaction of contradicting opposites to disagreements and to um, resolving you know, right or wrong lines within an organization. Uh, uh, the Red Guards Austin, you mentioned them, very important group in the history of um, the Maoist movement in the US, which is unfortunately not in a terribly advanced place relative to some other countries, including, I should say, some countries which are not uh, very, you know, very uh, backward colonized countries with a large peasant class. But um, there's a piece by Mao. It's often kind of named as being a, an unimportant piece, a piece of apocrypha, um, but I actually think it's a very good document uh, called On the Correct Handling of Contradictions Among the People. Um, maybe it's named as apocryphal because the title is long. Um, uh, uh, and he talks about essentially that uh, a disagreement within a political organization is a dialectic, the same as the dialectic between, between uh, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. And we can also use a dialectic to understand um, something like the interaction between two bodies in gravity. Um, ideas come into contradiction with each other, as do the circumstances that create them. And, and uh, one is dominant and one is um, su sublimated. And there is struggle, and either a contradiction is settled because it's non-antagonistic, it's found that a, a greater bridging can be found between them, or they are an antagonistic and there is a split, and one triumphs and the other goes the other way. Um, and so an organization might split around uh, a, a bad line, um, or an organization might um, resolve it, might find that the contradiction is non-antagonistic. Uh, you know, the Red Guards had a lot of good lines. They also had a lot of bad lines, a lot of organizational mistakes, I think some of which represented non-antagonistic contradictions, ultimately some that represented more serious contradictions that led to the dissolution of the, the CRCP USA. Um, in terms of like, as I understand your question, is there room to acknowledge a wrong line and go back and correct it uh, in Maoism? I don't know if I'm understanding the question exactly right, but, but is there room for that? I think yes, absolutely. But how you do that and how you understand and correct and change a wrong line through democratic struggle within an organization depends very much on what kind of contradiction the disagreement is, I think. Uh, do you want to add anything? I'm a tech question. Okay, so during this time we've heard oh sorry. We've heard this common implication of China becoming oh, becoming capitalist following its abandonment of Maoist thought. And indeed many leftists now will denounce China as a state capitalist betrayal of the revolution. This time has been approaching the group the current state of China as a failure of Mao's thought. However, some Trotskyist remnant groups of the new left, like the Spartacist League, continue to argue that even in the modern day, China is a deformed worker state ruled by an overgrown parasite bureaucrat class, but still characterizes it as the remains of a communist victory. So this is a two-pronged question on how this panel understands the divide in understanding of modern day China on the left. And secondly, I would also love to hear further discussion on the conception of Maoism as something fundamentally unsound or an ideology that was misapplied and further betrayed by Deng Xiaoping's uh, idea of reformism and opening the country. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody want to start with that? I have a go at that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have we gone? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, my my personal view on the uh, what what is China now? I I find it very hard to think that we can seriously characterise China as deformed worker state in any uh, it, as the old Trotskyist thing of it's a deformed worker state uh, in any sense because essentially uh, the Chinese China. China is different from the USSR, and it's different from the USSR actually because it was a much wealthier country before it was colonized. It was massively, the symbol of the sickle in the hammer and sickle is a symbol of the extraordinary backwardness 
of Russian agriculture and Russian rural society by comparison with West Europe of the late Middle Ages or with China uh, before the revolution. Okay, so China also had throughout the uh, Cold War period an external capitalist class sitting in Hong Kong, in uh, Singapore, etc. And in consequence uh, was able to develop in the transition back transition back to capitalism, uh, a finance capitalist sector, an autonomous finance capitalist sector, with the result that China has features of it which are still inherited from the bureaucratic regime, but is, in a certain sense, in rapid transition towards being a contender for world power, which makes it unavoidably in the situation of Germany uh, before 1914, which is where they are now. Anyone else? Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I have encountered the, the kind of groups you're describing, yeah, that like uh, uh, Trotskyist or like Marxist groups that use that language around China. I know the, um, the so-called Party for Socialism and Liberation takes more or less that line, um, which I had like a very brief association with before I studied Marxism seriously. Um, I think, I, I think that that phraseology is, is kind of uh, alien to like the real world, to be honest. I don't understand what a, a deformed worker state is supposed to mean. Um, it seems as if it exempts certain states from class analysis. Like, this one is bad in this way that's because it's bureaucratic and because it's Stalinist and all these things that are not a class analysis. You know, Lenin tells us that, that a state is fundamentally an implement of, of repression utilized by a given class. So if it's a worker state, then it's not deformed. And if it's deformed, then it's not a worker state. It's, it's a bourgeois state. It's got to belong to some class. I think the Chinese class um, belongs to, to uh, the imperialist bourgeoisie pretty unconditionally, pretty um, unequivocally. I think I would agree with the line that has been taken by um, the Maoists in India, by the, by the Naxalites, by the CPI Maoists, who put out a book on China called um, China, a Modern Social Imperialist Power. And obviously, you know, India is, is quite near China and has had experience of, of Chinese finance capital being imported into their country. So it's very hard to tell them that it is still in some way special and different from every other imperialist capitalist state. Uh, yeah. Do you want? Well, Mao was obviously a very complex personality, and you could see probably four at least four strands in him. There was obviously the revolutionary. How much of it was influenced by Marx himself, I can't say. E.J. Hobsbawm, when he wrote his book, The Short History of the 20th Century, The Age of Extremes, he said that uh, Mao had barely read any of Marx and probably only read Marx as distilled by Stalin and Stalin's, the Stalin-era writings. I don't know uh, how, Ma how well-versed Mao was in Marx. Uh, for certain, if you read something like, and I suspect many people in this room have, if you read Thomas More's Utopia, it's very hard not to notice how much of China under Mao resembled Moore's Utopia, down to only two outfits permitted per person, uh, and they're supposed to last for several, several years. It reads exactly like Mao. So there's clearly, you might call it a, a revolutionary or a, a romantic revolutionary. There's clearly that in Mao. Uh, there's also clearly a um, uh, nationalist element in Mao that can't be looked past. And it's an interesting question, it's a mind game to ask yourself, if Mao were to come back today, what would he think about China? I think he would be disappointed that obviously the so-called capitalist rotors won out in a big way, but there would probably be an element of real pride at China now being the cutting edge of world capitalism. There's a third element of Mao, Mao the Chinese. What does that mean? Well, Mao was a voracious reader. He was said to have a very large bed. 
uh, sometimes used for things which we don't want to go into. But <laughs> half of the bed was apparently piled with books, piled, piled high with books. And Mao was very deeply steeped in the Chinese tradition. And you could see towards the end of his life, he's trying to figure out where he would stand in the history of the emperors of China, in the history of the great epochs in China. So there is that third element. And there is the fourth element, the Stalinist element, which from which he was never able to fully emancipate himself, and from which he didn't know how one emancipates oneself. At one point during the Cultural Revolution, Mao uh, started to restrict the slogan, uh, to rebel is justified. Uh, it became to rebel against reactionaries is justified. And at some point, the question came up of the primacy of the Communist Party of China. And Mao, in an interview, uh, he said, every revolutionary movement needs a bronze core. That was his expression, needs a bronze core. That is to say, you can't make a revolution without that revolutionary party and that revolutionary party basically controlling pretty much everything. So those are four aspects to Mao. And the product of those four aspects is uh, the Mao, uh, as we know him, the synthesis. Uh, as to contemporary China, I do believe there is an important struggle for your generation. And that's to make sense of the Chinese economy, not domestically, but internationally. When you read Rosa Luxemburg's Junius pamphlet, she begins by saying, you can't judge any particular conflict strictly on that conflict. You have to see every conflict as situated within the fact that we're now living in the era of imperialism, as she called it. And so it doesn't make much difference who fired the first shot in each battle or in each war. The critical fact is all the powers are vying now for global supremacy, all the European powers. And now we have to ask ourselves the question, the United States is clearly, I don't think it's a matter of dispute, the United States is clearly out to demote China, to reduce China up to and including war. And then the question becomes, what stand do we take if there's a war between the US and China? Do we say these are imperialist powers, all of them, and we a plague on all your houses? Or do we say, no, China, as repressive as the internal regime might be, China is not an imperialist power in the same way as, say, the United States, and now NATO is. And therefore, we have to distinguish between the two and say, we're going to defend China's, China against any assault, regardless of who starts it, against any assault by the US, NATO, uh, in the war they're clearly now planning against China. And that, to me, comes down to how do we understand that Chinese regime. And I'm the first one to acknowledge I don't have an answer to that. OK, I'm, I'm told that we are out of time. Uh, can I ask for a round of applause for our speakers?